I can start with a triangle, dissect it up into four pieces, and then hinge those pieces around to form a square. Cool, right? This is a hinge dissection, and there's all sorts of hinge dissections from one polygon to another polygon. But did I really need four pieces to turn the triangle into a square? Could I have done it in less? Over a hundred years after this question was first posed and, and the four-piece solution was first discovered, a brand new paper has answered the question that no, you do need at least four pieces. Now, it's easy to reject that if I broke the triangle up into two pieces, it could never form a square. I just made up one way of doing that, and notice how that leaves one of the sides of the triangle not broken up. I could break up the triangle in some other way, and now it would be the base that's not broken up. But because the rules of the game are that I am breaking these up into simple polygons, I have only two edges of the crack, and so it can only go between two of the three edges. There's always the third one that remains. Now, I was really careful in my math. The triangle and the square here have exactly the same area. That's because when you do a hinge dissection, the area doesn't change. And in the square, the longest possible line segment that I could create is the diagonal of the square. But if I put the diagonal of the square up and compare it to the base of the triangle, it doesn't quite match. There's a, there's a little bit of an overlap. So this proves to me that it is impossible to break it up into two pieces. And I can use a similar argument to restrict how I could possibly break it up. Like, let's look at the vertex at the top, for instance. Even if I broke it into three pieces, it's impossible for me to break it up like this, where one of the cracks ends at the vertex, and that angle at that vertex is split into two. And it's the same argument. If the edges of one of the cracks ends at a vertex, that leaves an entire edge at the bottom, and again, the square can't possibly ever have a length long enough when you break up the square, there's always that little bit of overlap. So this is not possible. So here's one possible way I can imagine breaking it up into three different pieces, with the key thing being that there's a red dot, or the edge of a crack, on all three of the sides. And there's multiple ways to do that, like, for example, I can just move where the, the red dots are located, that's one way to do it. But I also could have a scenario like this one, this also breaks up every single side, but it does it in a little bit of a different way, right? That, that bottom side is now has two red dots, or break, broken up in two different places. So that's a, a different possibility. And, and here's a third possibility. And actually, if you stop and try to think about the ways that you could take the three edges and, and divide them up in three pieces, these are the only three possibilities. I mean, you could rotate them, you could take the red dots and, and change where they are on the sides, you could make the, the cuts that I've done in the middle be way more complicated, maybe they have you know, a million zigzags up and down. There's more possibilities than just these, but these are the three sort of ways that you can intersect the sides. Now, the way I've drawn these, I've gone and made different color coding for the vertices. So the red dots are meant to be the ones that intersect the sides. We've talked about that. The yellow dot in the middle are focused on spots where you have three cracks coming together, a vertex of degree three. And then for the pink dots, what I really want you to imagine is this is just a placeholder. The pink dot could be a much more complicated curve. It could go up and down and up and down and zig around and do all sorts of bizarre stuff. But it's just some polygonal curve. It's not intersecting. Every one of the vertices along it is going to have degree two. So imagine the pink dots when you see those as just placeholders for some complicated curve. So now let's focus a bit more on these degree three vertices, the yellow one where you've got sort of three cracks all meeting. There's a few different possibilities for these. One is you could have a scenario like this one where all three of the angles are less than the value of pi. You could also, however, have three things meeting together like this. This is a T-junction. And the crucial thing here is that you have some side that's actually exactly, exactly, exactly equal to pi. And this is a little bit different. The reason why this one is different is that you could imagine some larger piece that didn't have a vertex in the middle coming in and squeezing in against a spot that had a T-junction like this, that had a side that was equal to pi. So these vertices that have an angle of pi just behave differently in how you can glue pieces together than the ones that are less than pi. And then Similarly, you also enumerate uh, one, a scenario where you've got one that's got more than pi. So these are sort of three different cases. So if I go back to my three cases, I form those three cases as a three ways to deal with the edges. 
But if I look at the first of them, which also has that vertex of degree three, I'm gonna say that there's three possibilities for that as well. There's the one with all three angles less than pi, one with an angle exactly equal to pi, and one where there's an angle which is greater than pi. And so at a high level, I have five different cases for ways that I could draw my triangle. I mean, of course, I have infinitely many. Again, the, where the dots are located can move around, the, the pink dots are placeholders for all sorts of complicated stuff going on. But the basic structure is gonna look like this. And in mathematics, we do this type of thing all the time, which is we're looking at something that has infinitely many possibilities and we try to break it up into some cases, cases that are interesting enough that we can deal with and hopefully find some counterexamples for, but still cases that are big enough that we don't have too many cases that we have to deal with. So in the case of the triangle, we've broken it up into five different cases that we're going to analyze. So that was the triangle, but ultimately the triangle is supposed to unhinge into a square. So we also need to list like what are a way of categorizing squares. And using the exact same sets of rules that we were using to categorize the triangles, we can categorize the squares. It's just there's a lot more of them. There's 38 of them actually. This is one, the paper here shows all 38. You can dive into details if you wish. But for our purposes right now, the question is like, is it possible that some version of this triangle would go to some version of that square? Now you might think, well, visually the pieces don't look similar at all, but remember, I mean, these categorizations are placeholders for whole categories. Like the points can move around as much as you like, the pink dots are placeholders for, you know, arbitrarily long zigzagging curves. There's a lot of flexibility in our categorization. So like maybe with that, you can make them line up. Now, one way the paper rejects things is by counting angles. So, Let's look at the triangle and let's count all of the angles which are less than pi. So if I go through here, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. There's 12 angles which are less than pi showing up here. Now you might immediately say, Trevor, didn't you miss a few? You ignored the ones by the pink dots. But remember, the pink dots were the placeholders for these other curves. I'm not gonna worry about those right now. And specifically, if you want to dive into the details, what the paper really considers is the difference between the number of times an angle theta shows up and two pi minus theta shows up. So at the pink dots where you have theta and two pi minus theta pairs, it's ignoring those. But setting aside those details, the point is that if I count these number of angles at the non-pink dots, it has to be the same for the square. But if I count them up for the square, you'll notice that there's actually 14 such of these angles which are less than the value of pi and, and don't come from the pink dots. And that is enough to eliminate the possibility that the triangle with this configuration could go to the square with this configuration. Okay, but what about this other square? I mean, this is just another one on the list of 38 possible categorizations for the squares, but if you count its number of angles that are less than pi, you get 12. So the contradiction that I had used in the previous case to get rid of that possibility, I can't use the same contradiction in this case. And this is where I'll leave the details of the paper for you if you wanna peruse through, but the basic idea it does is this. It looked at all of these possibilities from the five categories of initial triangle to the 38 categories of squares, so a lot of cases, and it just goes through and starts rejecting one after another after another of them, sometimes grouping them together, by a whole bunch of very clever proof by contradiction techniques. And the exact type of contradictions change depending on what you're doing. Like in this one, we were doing something about angles. In other parts of the proof, they're making contradictions that are completely different, like that the ratio of lengths is, is rational when it has to be irrational, things like that. There's all sorts of different techniques, but at the end of the day, what the paper has managed to do is successfully go through and find for this categorization that every one of the cases is impossible. And thus, the scenario with only three pieces, this hinge dissection is not possible. Now, if you love learning math like I do, but wanna actually get better at it, then I strongly recommend the sponsor of today's video, which is brilliant.org. Brilliant is a learning platform for math, science, and computer science that puts you in the driver's seat of your own learning. All of their lessons are delightfully interactive. You get to manipulate the animations, you get to play around with the code, and you get to test your understanding with Brilliant supporting you if you get stuck. 
This kind of active, student-centered learning ensures that you've actually mastered each and every detail along the way. The lessons build up in layers so that you can do a little bit each day, growing your mathematical strength as you go and building up to tremendous progress over time. This is a fantastic way to learn mathematics. To try everything that Brilliant has for free, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, that's me, or click the link that's down in the description, and clicking that link will give you an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have questions, definitely leave them down in the comments, and we'll do some more math in the next video.